I'll uh, call the public hearing for the town of Morristown to order. Uh, my name is uh, Shap Smith. I am the town moderator, and I will be moderating um, today's informational meeting. This uh, hearing or meeting is a hybrid hearing, and there are participants meeting both in person and online, as you can see from uh, the TV screen there. Seated to my right are select board members Judy Bickford, Don McDowell, and Brian Kellogg. Also, the following staff are in attendance. Eric Dodge, who is the town administrator. Uh, Judy Elberry, who is the administrator's assistant. Kevin Barrows, who is the highway superintendent. Jason Luno, police chief. Tina Sweet, who is the finance director. Paula Beatty, who is the human resources director. Sarah Haskins, the town clerk and treasurer. Bill Mapes, the EMS chief. Denny DiGregario, who is the fire chief. Trisha Follard, who is the community development coordinator. Anna McCormick, recreation coordinator. And Terry Savins, who is the assessor who is joining us via Zoom. As many of you know, the annual town meeting is on Tuesday, March 7th, at the Morristown Municipal Building. The polls will be open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's no annual floor meeting this year, and all articles will be voted on by Australian ballot. All active registered voters have been mailed ballots. You can contact the town's clerk, town clerk's office if you have any questions about your ballot or how you can exercise your right to vote via those ballots. The annual town report is a historical record of the town. Inside it, you will find the proposed budget, department reports, as well as reports from many community organizations. If you do not have a town report, you may pick one up from the table in the hall or raise your hand at this time and we will be glad to deliver one to you. Does anybody need a town report? A digital format is also available on the front page of the town website. Uh, you'll note that the select board proudly dedicates the 2022 town report to Donnie Blake for his positive impact to our community over the past 40 years. And please see the full dedication on the first page of the town report. Uh, Well-deserved recognition. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Does mention Julie too, right? Yes. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, anyone in wishing to speak in person must come forward to the microphone in the center aisle. We would ask that you not touch the microphone. I'll just note that the microphones are not for this room. They're actually to integrate with the, um, the Zoom proceeding as well, those who are on Zoom. Participants on Zoom should click on the raise their hand button if they wish to speak and mute their microphone when they are not speaking. Online participants, please confirm that you can hear me by clicking on the raise your hand button. Okay. All participants must state their full name before addressing the assembly. One thing that's important, I know that there are some issues that uh, generate um, some passion uh, with regard to this particular town budget. And one of the ways um, that we try to make sure that we can have a good conversation while not personalizing it is to, tr to address all questions and remarks to the moderator not to personal individuals. Um, it sort of worked when I was Speaker of the House. Hopefully it will work here. Um, I would ask that your speeches or any comments that you make be confined to the merits of the article. If you engage in personal attacks on a member of the body, we will ask that you refrain from doing so. In-person participants will be allowed to speak first, then Zoom participants. All participants will be allowed to speak twice on a given article for a maximum duration of two minutes each time. 
After you've spoken once on a particular article, you will not be recognized a second time during the discussion of that article until all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. The warning for each one of the articles is published on pages one through four of your town report, and we will be discussing articles three through 37 this evening. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? I just have one question. Judy? There's something on the chair, and I'm wondering if that needs to be there. There's a microphone or something? I think it's the WCAX microphone. It's on oh, the chair. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So if anybody wants a chair right in the front row <laughs> that has been vacated. Yeah. Sort of like being on the bus. <clears throat> so um, seeing no questions, why don't we actually go through and review each article. And what I will do is I will actually read the article for you um, and then uh, ask people to raise their hands if they have any um, comments they'd like to make about it. So the first one that we will discuss is Article 3. Article 3 reads, shall the voters authorize payment of real and personal property taxes in two equal installments, with the due dates being November 15th, 2023, and May 15th, 2024, by physical deli delivery to the town treasurer before 4 p.m. on that date or delivery to the municipal office postmarked on or before that date. This article is about not the amount, but shall um, that, that be allowed. Are there any questions about Article 3? Seeing none. May I, may I clarify? Yes. That if this doesn't pass, then the taxes will become due 30 days from the date of the mailing of the taxes, the entire tax bill. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? So Article 4 reads, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $10,106,209, of which $8,656,282 shall be raised by taxes, and $1,449,927 shall be raised by non-tax revenues. Open the floor for discussion. Any discussion? Seeing none, yeah, Buckwheat. Thank you, Marshall. Could you uh, explain to us why you have to have this kind of money um, with taxpayers? I think you're way overboard on everything here, what I've been looking at. And I want you guys to uh, please explain it. Where's where, where it going? Where's it going to spend on? Is it going to be a slush fund or is it going to be <coughs> proper for the town? Who would uh, like to start answering that question? It's a pretty loaded question. It's, it's pretty broad based. <laughs> it's really what I want, I want to explain to everything we're going to do with this money. Make it easy, okay? All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 In a general purpose, the, the money is uh, there to support the operations of the town government, to include all the departments, highway, uh, the uh, emergency services, the local government. Uh, specifically, I'm not sure which direction to go, Buckley. Uh, if you could help me out with something. Can I explain it, Don? Nobody's going to ask anything. I can ask it. Well, I, I just want to be um, careful about the. Uh, each person is allowed to speak twice. 
Um, each person gets two minutes. So if nobody else wants to speak, I, I kind of think if we look at page 24 of the town report, it has the proposed budget there, the general government figures, the police department, the fire department kind of gives you an overview of where the money is going to be going without going into specifics for each, each department, each item. And that, those are also listed in the budget too, line item. Question is, people were come, came to the meeting to learn something what they're going to go to the budget. But you should go through those uh, articles, articles on the point by point, and with that money for it, why you're getting that much money out. You don't expect explanation, really. So, what I understand you to be asking for, Richard, is um, some general explanation for each yeah. uh, department's budget and how it's going and, to be spent. And, uh, and the uh, faculty, uh, the, the workers. Yep, yep. There's a lot of money in there going somewhere else. So, so do you think, um, could somebody sort of generally describe the budget for each department, what it generally goes to? That works. Um, and then if people have, other people have specific questions, perhaps we can take those specific questions. And I do see that there are a number of hands that are raised. So once you're done. So well, I'll start off with the local government, uh, general government budget, and then I'll have uh, each of the department heads speak to their, their department specifically. Uh, the general government covers all operations within this building here. Uh, it's uh, from the zoning office up front. The uh, reasonably new but uh, growing uh, recreation coordinator the uh, assessors, listers are up front in their office. The town clerk's uh, function with the uh, clerk, uh, the assistant clerk treasurer and uh, Elizabeth, who's our administrative assistant in there. Then in the back office, we have uh, our finance office, which we have uh, two ladies that staff that. We have uh, an HR director. We have myself. I have uh, my assistant. We have our community development coordinator. Um, we have our listing coordinator. I think that covers the staff that work here in the office. There's roughly a dozen of us here. Chief Luno. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Can I just make a general comment that Everything that you mentioned, uh, the general government, um, post budget, is listed item by item, beginning on page 36 and ending on page 47. Is that correct? Yes. Eric? That's correct. That's the budget portion for the general government, yes. Thank you. I see several hands raised here. Yes. Could, I, and I don't want to interrupt the flow here tremendously, but we were asked about all the departments. And I, I, was, I think I was looking one, to have each of the department heads explain their, their I departments. think given the fact that you've spoken, I think people raised their hands after you spoke. So I, I think I'll give people a chance. Okay. That's fine. Um, and then. Uh, if people feel it's necessary and continue to have questions, we can have a department by department. Mm. Yes. Um, Travis I actually have a clarifying question on page 24. Is this the budget overview for the FY24 budget? Because it says 2022 to 2023 for the first budget. It is the 24. Okay, so is that a typo? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes. I'm not sure about the percentage, Tom, but I can talk to you about the growth year 
in the general town government that that might. Uh, the town of Marston budget overview. I got off in the town site. Mm -hmm. States here that in uh, the budget of the twenty uh, three forty four fifty two percent. Right. And the twenty one annual account report has the uh, change sixteen point two percent. So these are your figures. Sir. So if you explain how come it went up sixty eight point two percent in two years. It's for Zoom. It's not an amplifying microphone. So the 52% that's being proposed in the, the budget for next year. And 16 that you had for last year increase in this budget. Okay. Yeah. How I, can I'm, you go 68 in two years? Certainly. I, uh, I'm happy to explain that, Tom. I, so I, I started here in, uh, in July of 21. <coughs> After serving five years on the select board, I came into this office and I spent the first four to six months doing a lot of analysis, just analysis via watching, looking, seeing, reading, uh, looking at our uh, employee policies, moving our way through the building, uh, observing and talking, asking lots of questions, educating myself on different functions within the town government. I was very familiar with many of them, but not to the level that the town administrator's seat requires. So it was, uh, it was obvious to me that there were spots within town government that uh, were overloaded. Frankly, they were, uh, they were not hardly treading water with their workload. They were re being required to work overtime hours in order to uh, get their work completed. And uh, the one I'm speaking specifically of was a finance office. So when I came here, I had uh, uh, Tina, our finance director, at the time, our assistant finance director was Paula, who's now our HR director. The two of them together were handling not only all the finances for the town, but they were also handling all the human resources uh, functions for the town as well. It was, uh, the, frankly, the human resources function was the piece that was taking the most of their time. We instituted uh, pretty quickly a new hiring process. The one that had been in place was uh, it wasn't up to the normal, up to the modern standards. I'll put it that way. Uh, we we started doing uh, interviews for anybody that was going to receive taxpayer funds to include our counselors for the recreation program. <coughs> we had uh, two employees from the highway department that uh, that left our employment. Uh, we conducted exit interviews. That had never been done before. We started off uh, doing evaluations, uh, employee evaluations, which hadn't been done in years. It was obvious from the feedback that I was getting that there were many things here within the function of the town that had fallen behind. And a lot of that was due because of the growth of our community. In fact, much of it was. The, I, the feedback I was getting from all the town staff was that the volume of traffic into this building had increased so substantially they'd never seen it this busy before. That, that comment was made time and again to me. So we started to look at the different offices and the functions within them to see if there was efficiencies that could be built in. How could we alleviate the stress uh, on our staff? And that, that was the obvious part. And in the back of the office, it was in the finance department. So initially, what we had identified was the need for an administrative assistant to the finance department. We thought, well, you know, if we could take some of the, the accounts payable and maybe some of the payroll stress off from that office with a, a part-time staff person, then that might be the, the answer to our issues. And so that's what we budgeted for in the first year. We also increased uh, our staff at the EMS department by two full-timers and reduced our paid part-timers up there by one in order to try and balance that out a little bit. So we had, we had staffing increases not only here, but uh, in the other rest of the town. Um, we went on uh, to find that the, the human resources piece, we, we had an issue in town that I can't go into because it's a personnel matter, but it was a substantial personnel matter and one in which I I dove into to try and help and uh, settle and try and retain as many employees as I could. Uh, some upset folks. And Paula, being 
from a background of human resources, I turned to her and I said, can you give me a hand with this? And she did. And she had one meeting with one person. And as a result of that meeting, ended up meeting with an entire department. And as a result of that meeting, the tension settled. Things went back to work. Problem solved. And it was that issue in and of itself that directed me to the fact that human resources was the thing that was overburdening the finance department. So we changed directions. And not the preferred way of doing it. It would have been wonderful if I, if I had had the foresight to, to budget for that position in the fall and have it approved for this current fiscal year. So what we did instead is Tina and I started looking at the budget. We identified the money that had been set aside for the assistant to the uh, finance office on a part-time basis. We took that pool of money. We looked throughout the budget. We found other areas that if we saved on our expenditures uh, that we would be able to add to that pot in order to cover the expense of the staff position of an HR position. We've been able to do that successfully. As of the end of last month, we are on par. We are not falling behind and we are going to be able to fund that without overdrawing the budget. That was, that was the, the first, I think, the large component change that we made. Um, Anna coming on board last uh, summer as our seasonal part-time or seasonal uh, recreation coordinator. She worked full-time hours through the summer months, putting a town employee with direct oversight of our recreation program. It was long overdue. It had been run, the program had been run by a parent volunteer for many years. Which was, which was fine, but there are requirements that weren't being met that needed to be. And we also wanted to better train our counselors uh, on, on the roles and responsibilities they have. So Anna jumped in and she ran the day-to-day -day operations last year, recreation department, making suggestions along the way. Um, it was uh, important that we have someone from the town there to watch it. There's probably no greater responsibility given to any human being than to have oversight over the safety and care of someone else's child. And we took it very seriously. So the addition of that piece was also an increase to our budget. Um, I mentioned the rescue squad. Uh, the fall, the first year I was here, it became obvious when we had a full-time staff member out uh, on sick, extended sick leave that the three full-time personnel we had at the time and the six paid part-time personnel were not generating enough hours in order to cover the schedule. And we had holes in our schedule which were needed to be covered by uh, mutual aid services. So we instituted a, a position, two positions uh, full-time and then reduced the paid part-time by one. So that gave us five full-time and five paid part-time. So that brought our staffing up and the hours available through that along with eight active volunteers to cover 24-7 operations going forward. The police department, uh, we added a lieutenant, so the detective lieutenant's position uh, became uh, blatantly obvious to us being the number two uh, highest overdose rate in the state for 2021, that uh, our problem here was no different than many other communities, but uh, it was in our face that we needed to take steps in order to address this on a, on a very direct approach. And the, the personnel we had at the police department, uh, they had their hands full just answering calls, never mind doing proactive uh, drug <coughs> interdiction. So the police lieutenant's position was created uh, and filled by a very qualified person, and uh, that, that is up and running now. The uh, last year, the cost of living uh, adjustment to the wage scales was 5.7%. Um, we figure up the cost of living off the first quarter of the fiscal year. It's the same formula that's used for Social Security, and that percentage is applied to all the scales, both union and non-union. Uh, those increases in personnel, that increase in the uh, cost of living, uh, plus all employees get a step, which is their actual raise. It's a one and a half percent raise for the PD. It's a 1.6 percent raise for the general government uh, staff. And the highway department gets a 1.7 percent increase uh, on their steps. So uh, 
that's where those those expenses came from. Last year, I think we presented a 12.9 percent budget proposal for increased operations, uh, operational costs here for the town. That 12.9 turned into a 9.9 uh, as a result of grand list growth last year, which was 1.6 percent. So there was a, a drop of 3 percent on our operating cost to the taxpayers uh, just through the grand list growth. <coughs> this year, cost of living increase was 8.7 percent, largest one anybody's seen in, in recent history that we can even remember. That 8.7, again, will apply to all pay scales, union and non-union across the board. Everybody gets a step increase as well. This is for the proposed budget coming up. That uh, was a significant portion. We're also proposing the, the full funding of the human resources department uh, in that position, uh, requesting to go to a full recreation coordinator's position that can work year round, not only just for the summer program, but also providing recreational programming for uh, all ages throughout the year. She's already been involved in uh, snowshoeing outings. She's been involved in the turkey trot, which is the first ever race we've had on uh, Thanksgiving morning here. Uh, she is building the program, uh, utilizing resources from around the state and her peers and other programs. She is putting together booklets and policies and uh, a week-long training versus a one-day training for our counselors. So she's doing an extremely good job, a very comprehensive look at this program to put on the best program we can. We are asking for another police officer. Currently, our staffing doesn't allow us for, to have double covers 24 hours a day. <clears throat> Last year, our police department responded to over 5,200 complaints. That's an increase of 12 to 1,400 complaints, I think, from the year before. Am I close, Jason? 1,200, I think it was. Uh, Having only one officer on from 2 a.m. to roughly 2 p.m. in a community our size, the number of calls they're fielding, and the severity of some of the crime that we're having, uh, plus the drug epidemic we're, we're all suffering from, was uh, a driving force behind the request for another officer so that we can have double coverage 24 hours a day. Our backup for our officers sometimes is a minimum 15 minutes away. Even if the sheriff's department has somebody in their office, it's still depending on where the call is coming from, it can be 10 to 15 minutes response time. Or Stow PD, the same thing. Uh, I think it's obvious from everybody's trips to the grocery store, uh, it's probably the easiest and most common uh, comparison I can make. You come out of the grocery store with two bags, now it used to be four bags a year ago. The cost of everything has gone up, that includes everything the municipal government uses for services and for materials. We budgeted for this year, for this current budget year, $78.65, does that sound right, for yeah, salt? Something like that. In that, in that, in that arena, it's just over $78 a ton. Uh, we average 2,800 tons of salt per year, per winter. We budget for 3,100 ton of salt to be used. That's the worst case scenario. We know what the average is. We, we budget high in the event that the winter is gonna be severe. We budgeted at 76, 70, $78.60 something cents a ton. And when we went to purchase the salt this fall, it was $91 a ton. We had drastically under budgeted for salt without knowing. The prices didn't come out for the salt. We asked for them throughout the summer and fall. The suppliers didn't have the numbers until the last minute. Uh, we can go through the same process with fuel. We budgeted based on a formula given to us from a website that the federal government puts out where their people project and predict costs going forward. Uh, we budgeted our fuel, our diesel fuel at $4 a gallon. I never would have expected it to be close to six, but that's where we were. And uh, we have been blessed on both of those fronts with a light winter. We've had less call outs for our highway department because of it, so our fuel expenses are down, our salt usage is down. We only order, we only buy the salt that we order. We don't have a 3,100 ton pile of salt. We order it as we go. We have two sheds, one at each of the garages. So we don't spend all the money if we don't need to. We only buy as much salt as the winter requires us to do so. So any monies in the budget that don't get spent on that salt are carried forward. Uh, 
I mean, I could go through services, I could go through a whole bunch of other things, but I think we all know that the costs of everything have gone up. So I would say that the bulk of our increases are, are buried within the increase in salaries across the board. Uh, we're asking for some staffing increases, and I think we're also seeing a, our cost of services and materials has gone way up as well. Other questions? Tom, um, the fact of the matter, so you've gotten a chance to speak once. The rules, as I articulated them, are that you get to speak again once everybody else has okay. had an opportunity. Tom, yes. chat, before that, we, I think, may yep. I say something? You may. I'd like to say that Eric shared every single piece of information that he's sharing here tonight <coughs> with the select board <coughs> at our meetings. We heard all this information. Can I regurgitate it word for word like he has? Absolutely not. But he, spot on, he has, he has shared all this. It's uh, on the video whenever you need to see it. Thank you. Thank Very you, well Judy. done. Uh, Tony Cody from Cody Hill. So I want to know what gives the town the right to use 8.7% like Social Security does. Social Security recipient makes, on average, $15,000 a year. You town people make, on average, $75,000 a year, plus benefits. I think that's a little greedy myself, when a $15,000 Social Security recipient has to come up with this tax money that you're proposing. Just think about that and tell me that it's not greed. It, is that an appropriate question to be asking at this time? I think that uh, this time is with regard to people are both allowed to comment and ask questions. So it's both an informational meeting, but it's also opportunity for members of the community to actually comment on the budget. And that is something that Eric actually did um, relay, that it was the increase for both uh, unionized and non-unionized employees. So I think it's appropriate for uh, someone to be able to comment on it. So this is both an informational meeting and it's an opportunity for the public to give feedback about their feelings about the budget that's being proposed. It's sort of in lieu of what we would see at town meeting. Are there, are there any other comments? Yes. Hi, Laura Streets. I first of all want to say that I don't think any Vermonters, most Vermonters uh, make enough money. <laughs> It's the state of state of the state, um, but I do have a clarifying question um, in regards to increases in salaries. Um, I think what I heard, and I just you can tell me if I was correct, that the only increases in the salaries were 5.9 percent last year, and this year an 8.7 percent are the only increases they've received. You no, know, there was some restructuring that we did in the first the fall of the uh, my first year here as well. A uh, proposal we bought there incorporated in the current budget year. Uh, the pay scale that we had for the non-union staff uh, had not been adjusted for a period of over 10 years, to the best of anybody's knowledge. So I took the pay scale that we had, uh, which the job descriptions for the non-union staff were all over the place in this scale. There didn't seem to be any semblance of order. And I took them and reassembled them in an ascending uh, order uh, of uh, responsibility. A little bit subjective, but uh, fairly clear, having, having spent four to six months here, what the levels of responsibility were, the size of the budgets, the amount of people that people supervised. So we re re reorganized that pay structure, and I looked at the base pay of the least responsible person, and that's a horrible way to put it, the person with the least amount of responsibility, that's a better way to put it, the administrative assistant position we have on our scale. I looked at the base pay that that position had, and it was low enough that it would be in competition with McDonald's uh, or many other assembly line positions that are in uh, any job here in town. Yet what we expect of our administrative assistants here uh, in the town clerk's office is a depth of knowledge, people skills. Uh, I, I can have Sarah speak more specifically to Elizabeth and her qualifications. Uh, and what she does perform here, but it is certainly worth more than the uh, $17 an hour, $18 an hour that 
was listed, and I'm not sure it's even that high. So once we, I put those in an ascending order based on responsibility, it was a 30-year pay scale. Now these the non-union employees are 30-year retirement system employees, so they have to work for 30 years in order to, to uh, reach full retirement. They're eligible for retirement after five years vested in the program. However, it's 30 years before they can collect a full retirement and past age 62, I believe, before they can start drawing that retirement. It didn't make a lot of sense for me that we were giving step increases for the full period of their career. To me, it uh, seemed more appropriate that we go to a 25-year scale and down from the 30 and uh, mm -hmm. that they should receive cost of living increases only in the last five years they're here but that their retirement is based off their highest three years earning average. So in their last three years of five, uh, before they hit their 30 year mark, they would have their highest earning capacity. The way I did that was to take and look at the hourly rate, step one, for that administrative assistant. I was looking for that position to be at in or around the ballpark of $20 per hour on step one of the scale. That was accomplished simply by taking the first five steps of the scale and cutting them off and throwing them away. Then we moved the personnel up the scale the same five steps. So the new scale looked to be step one was formerly the step six. And that's where the base of the scale started. And then we adjusted the rates of pay down through on step one for those positions in a manner that was appropriate to the level of responsibility they were carrying. And in comparison to other uh, job descriptions from other municipalities around the state was in line with about the middle of the road. Uh, some a little higher, some a little lower, but uh, pretty much on the average around the state. So that's how I, I came to the new pay scale and the new adjusted rates of pay. And yes, and then there was the 5.7%, uh, 5.9%, whatever it was, uh, increase. It might be helpful to clarify whether that was in 2022 to 2023. It's in today, in the current budget, the 22-23 budget, yes. We're, we're voting, as I understand it, on the 23 to 24 budget. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. Laura, mm -hmm. um, before you start, because I did this to Tom, mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah, all right. Uh, I, so I, I know people are online. And just as a reminder, I, I said it before, we're gonna have questions from people in person, IRL, and then we'll hear from the people uh, online. So, yes. My name is uh, Dave Campbell. <clears throat> I've lived in Marshville all but four years of my life. I'm 75 years old. <clears throat> and you talk about salaries going up 8%, and that's a hefty raise, especially knowing what people are getting paid here in this town. Uh, right now, on the 23 budget, uh, I won't use any names, but if I use, um, the position you know, but one of the top positions for right now is getting ninety-three thousand six hundred dollars a year. The proposed increase is one hundred one thousand seven hundred and fifty-four dollars. And there's no employee hardly under fifty or under fifty thousand dollars at all. And I would dare say that people in this town now or back when I was employed and I worked for a major propane company ever got paid that kind of money and how do you think retired people like myself uh, and others are going to afford to pay this huge increase in taxes it's not fair it's ludicrous uh, you're looking at I don't know how many employees 50 employees making well over $50,000 a piece and us retired people, as Tony said, are not making that kind of money. And yes, we had, I had a retirement, I have a retirement. My wife and I, 
whom passed away suddenly in September, we saved so that we could go to Florida in the winters. And it's, this budget is just ludicrous. It's out of range for people that live here. Um, I'm afraid that you're gonna lose people from this community or people not gonna wanna move here. I know what other towns pay. And that's all we have. Thank you, Dave. What's that? Can people, if could you raise your hand if you can hear on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really kind of hard to hear them. They need to stand a little closer. Thank you. Everybody hear that? Speak into the microphone. Okay. Are there other comments uh, or questions before we? Uh, go to the people who are on Zoom. Yes. My name is Bill Robinson. I've been living here for 10 years. Closer. Closer? Yeah. I don't want to bite it. <laughs> um, so, the fellow before me ref reflects the things that I have been hearing for the last couple of months. And I wonder how this group, in their discussion about raising prices everywhere, took into account the ability of the people of the town to actually pay it without hurting their set of need. Did you take that into account? By golly, this is a lot of money. You can't do it to the people. We well, most certainly I think, did. I think also you have to realize. So, that so why don't we why don't we do it ordered? Okay. Um, I'll let the um, uh, select board speak first, and then um, because they're the ones who actually make the recommendation, um, and then if Eric wants to uh, chime in, I have to realize that the five of us. Can you there, also speak? There were five of us making working on this budget or approving the budget we all have to pay the taxes too and i am also retired so i am impacted don is impacted brian is impacted bob and jess are impacted just as much as everybody sitting in this room this was a <coughs> difficult budget for us to pass and we did we did agonize over it we feel it's in the best interest of the town and that's why we approved it thank you um, Anybody else? I yeah, you get yeah. you get the comment, and if you want to make another one, I've done this to everybody who's been there. Yep. <laughs> Trying to be consistent. Be sure to let their take their time off. If he's speaking, you should have a full two minutes and be interrupted. I'll take that under advisement, Mr. Lowe. Are there any other comments from the floor? Seeing none, uh, Jamie. Jamie. Yeah. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we can hear you, but we've got to adjust your volume a little bit. Okay. Give me the thumbs up when you're ready. Thumbs up. All right. You're all set. Okay. Um, I'm just looking for a little bit of uh, of clarification when I look at some of the the road maintenance uh, numbers. Um, when I look at the summer and winter uh, maintenance, I see purchase of gravel and sand to about $125,000. Uh, but I also see over under operate and maintain building about $105,000 to operate the Duhamel pit. I'm a little bit confused where one is to purchase sand and gravel and another one is to extract it for our use. Um, can someone just help me understand that a little bit better? So, Jamie, um, can you just um, state your full name so that we have it for the record? Yeah, uh, James Brewster. James Brewster. Thanks, Jamie. Yep. Yeah. Who wants to take that? So, the, the Jamie, can you give me a, a, a direction on the 100000 from maintain a building? I'm not sure what that was. So, I've got here under the Highway Street Department budget, there's an area for operate and maintain building. It's, it lists, my page says page five. It's like maybe 34 or 35 in the overall document. 
<clears throat> He's talking about this, I think. Okay. Oh, I, got, I just couldn't see past your hand. Oh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I see is 20,000 for Duhamel pit operations, 30,000 for crushing, 30,000 for the pit amendment, which I don't understand if these funds can't be used until after July. Um, and then phase three Duhamel pit operations to $25,000, which creating the haul road in itself is going to be creating aggregate to be used on the roads. So it seems like it should be one or the other, either the 105 to operate the pit or the 125 to buy the materials, but not both. Understood. So, yep. Yeah, thank you for that, Jamie. Yeah. So the breakdown that you're seeing there about the gravel pit, uh, we're, again, budgeting's best guess. So we still don't have a finalized permit in hand yet. So as I explained in the, the budget hearings, the uh, the money for purchased materials okay. was there in order to afford to buy materials if in fact we went yet another summer without being able to get into our gravel pit we would have funds in the budget in order to uh, purchase those materials if we did have a gravel pit which we, we really are hoping that we are going to see the permit before spring then the monies for the purchased materials would transfer over to pit operations now in order to get the pit started we have to begin to build the haul road currently that's a fully vegetated uh, we need to hire a contractor to come in and cut off the tree and remove the overburden hauling it away from the gravel pit. We don't have uh, a great handle on what that total expense is going to be. We can modify a little bit of that expense uh, as we go and uh, based on how far up we make the cut, whether we cut all the way up to the meadow or uh, a, a portion of that way. Uh, will depend upon the, the prices we get back from a request for proposal. So there are some significant unknowns in opening up that haul road. You're right. The haul road itself is uh, great gravel, and we are going to be extracting as we go. But in order to get that haul road started, we need to have a contractor come in and uh, get that the trees cut, the stumpage and overburden moved off, the topsoil pushed up to the edges to expose that uh, gravel that's underneath. So there are some unknowns there. So the expenses you see built in there are best guess at, at the at the best that we could do. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Um, next, Carly, could you identify yourself through your full name, please? Um, yes, this is uh, Kathy Chafee. Um, so I might have missed it because I got kicked off. So tell me if I missed it, and I'll go back and and watch later. Um, but Eric, you explain your secretary's salary and I just want to say, um, it's not a personal attack, but Dan Lindley, um, had a, a, a degree for being, had, Dan Lindley was a town manager and had a degree to back his schooling. Um, and after 15 years of being with us, if I'm correct, he made about $85,000. Um, Eric started out in June of 21, around $63,000. Now he's at 93,000 ish and he's looking at over $101,000. Can you explain Eric, if you have a degree for that and, um, why you feel that, um, you, um, deserve a salary of over $101,000. So um, I'm going to, I think this is, a, this is a tricky one, Kathy. Um, this sort of verges on um, personal questions, but I think it's appropriate to discuss uh, what qualifications are for town administrator um, and what um, uh, what the salary range is within uh, the various uh, areas. So, uh, Kathy, I'm trying to reframe it so that it doesn't, uh, it's not personalized, um, but that tries to give you the information that you're asking for. Shep, can I take a shot at this? Yes. So, I did some data analysis just about a week ago. 
gathering data from uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Actually, we had one of the. Can you make sure you the, speak into the microphone the so people? Please yeah. help me get this data, but I do have copies of it. And what I did was, in regards to this very specific question that was bothering me a little bit, I got a bunch of data here from towns across the state of Vermont. And the first thing I did when I did the analysis, I said there's no reason to compare our administrator's salary to a city like Burlington, where clearly there's a lot more responsibility, nor is there any reason to compare us to a town like Glover, where there was nowhere near as much responsibility. So what I did was, I looked at all the towns that had a population of at least 3,500, and I'll explain why in a second. I looked at all the towns that had a population less than 7,500. Why those two numbers? Because Morristown is 5,500. So I went 2,000 people above and 2,000 people below. I did a very simple little chart. Nice little graph. Happy to share it with anybody. It's right here. And there's probably about, I haven't counted it up recently, 25, 27 towns on there. <clears throat> and when you do it, you get a nice little trend line. You get a nice little graph. Very easy to read. Don, can, because Kathy is the one who. And Kathy, you get this that. nice little trend line. <laughs> and when you get this trend line, guess where Morristown, and what, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really explaining what the line is. It's, it's population versus pay rate. The pay rate of those town administrators. For those towns between 35 and 7,500. And when you do it, Morristown falls below the line. We don't fall on the average. We actually fall a little bit less than the average, which is very interesting to look at. I had no idea what it was going to look like. It's very objective data. I didn't leave anybody out. I didn't add anybody in. I didn't change it. Actually, you know, at first I started at 3,000 and went up to 7,500, and then that's when I had the wherewithal to think that 35 to 75 made more sense. It didn't change anything at all. So I just want to be clear, because there's been so much talk about how the salaries are out of whack. They're not in this case. They're just not. I'm sorry. You can't look at this data and think otherwise. I mean, you can, you can, I suppose you could do something different and you can critique the analysis I did, but it is the data that we have, and I just want to make that really clear. So, uh, Kathy, I, I, I have to be consistent with the way that I've been doing things, which is um, you, you get one question, and then you'll get a follow-up, OK? Um, and uh, I think she, uh, Kathy, also asked about the qualifications for the town administrator and maybe somebody who was involved in that search can talk about what the um, what was put out uh, in sort of the uh, w whatever you put out for qualifications for the office um, and how you made that decision. I think that would be helpful for people as well. I, I sat on that committee. I'll, I'll say a little bit. First of all, uh, Don or Dan Lindley was not a town manager. He was a town administrator. So we have to start there. Um, and we had candidates come to us, um, to the, select, to the um, uh, committee, uh, review committee, and um, we had town managers, we had town administrators, and we, um, we looked at them, and, I, and um, Eric put his hat in the, in the ring. Is this an appropriate thing for me to be talking about? I, I think what you can talk about, I think what's appropriate to uh, talk about is the what, what, the, what, what the job description was, uh, what qualifications you were seeking from that job, uh, from an applicant for the job, um, and, uh, and... And I don't recall all of those details. Yep. I sat on the committee, I was in, in, involved in the process, but I couldn't tell you verbatim what the job description was. 
um, and then ha perhaps s uh, a little bit about how you uh, made decisions about uh, qualifications. We, and I realize I'm going a little bit. Yeah. I, I'm trying to. I'm tr trying to depersonalize it, but help people yeah. understand. Uh, and, and so, stop me if I'm going off of the rails here. Yeah. Um, and so we we looked at everybody who came in front of us. Um, I was really interested in having a town manager. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's applicable here, but it wasn't the the way the the committee wanted to go. So I had my mindset on something else. And Dan was uh, directing us and said that when Eric came to us, Eric would be a good candidate. And um, I took Dan at his word. I trusted what Dan was saying. I trusted that what he was giving us would be a good choice. I don't know, Brian, were you sitting there with us yes. too? Yes. Yeah, and, and so as, as a committee, we made the decision, and I wasn't the only one, that we chose Eric as our candidate to lead us. First of all, he knows our community. He lives here. So that was going to be a big plus for those of us who were looking at someone coming into our town. Does that help? We'll see. <laughs> Chat, can I, can I add just a little bit to this? Is it okay? You, you may, <laughs> if you want to. So first of all, I want to correct a factual error Dan Lindley did not have a degree. Dan Lindley and I talked at length about this because I said that to him when I considered throwing my hat in the ring. I said, you know, I don't have a college degree. And he said, well, I don't either. Dan came to us as a retired master chief from the Navy, having spent a full career, full time for the Navy. But he worked with CDs. He, had, he actually went uh, around to different bases and uh, worked with them on designing roads and runways. So that was Dan's background in the construction industry. I came to this throwing my hat in the ring with the qualification that not only did I live here, but I'd had a full career in the police department of 24 years. I'd been on the board for five years uh, on the select board. I spent 22 years in the military. So leading people was something I was comfortable doing. Motivating people was something I was comfortable doing. Understanding the direction of the town, understanding the direction of local government, understanding how all the pieces of local government fit together was all something I learned as a member of the select board. So given all those pieces put together, I felt that I had as good a chance as anybody of being qualified to apply for the position. If I remember correctly, there were about 40 applicants from around the region. Uh, I think they selected six people to be interviewed. And uh, I was chosen. And I was not Judy's first choice. So, so that's a little beyond where we need to go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, I realize that I've given a little bit of latitude here, but I, thought, I think it's context. I and mean, we really, what we're here to talk about is the particular article and, and particular questions about uh, certain items on there. But I thought that since somebody had asked a question, it was appropriate to sort of uh, address that. So um, Tom and then Mr. Cody afterwards. OK, yep. yep. Nope. I called you, Tom. Uh, Eric, I'm not going to ask about your qualification or anything. You're, you're doing well explaining this. You better get closer to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, my question, again, uh, is goes back to the the increase in the last uh, couple of years on the general government part of the budget. You, you devoured some of the EMS, which they do a great job, and that, I'm not worried about their side of the budget. You, you referred to the police, and they have their own budget, and they, uh, that's, you know, nobody's got a negative word to say about them either. My question was, how could, and it, it seemed the answer was, do all to raise uh, salary increases is how the general uh, government budget went up 62, uh, 68 point two 68.2% in two years. I don't worry about the, the police budget, the EMS budget, or the fire department. This is just from the general government budget. How it has to be more than just salaries. And then how can you expect the 68.2% increase 
to be paid by 2,400 households. There's only 5,400 people in this town. How can we afford this? And that's my question. Fair enough. Uh, I would add in that we have uh, more than just residential properties here that help to support the tax base. We have a very active industrial base here, commercial base, mm -hmm. so it's not just 24 household, 2400 households that are supporting the budget. But I'm not trying to distract from your question. The question was about the general government increases over two years. Yes, salaries were a part of that. They were a big part of that, for sure. I came into this job in 2021 when the pandemic was winding down. We had just stopped wearing masks. Every business place in Morristown had help wanted ads in it. The workforce seems to have disappeared. People that you have in place, in all the conversations I had with my peers around the state was all about how do we attract more people to government service? How do we attract more people with specialized skills to come work in the finance office, to come work at the highway department, to come work at the police department? My thought process, because my time in my last few years in the military was around working on retention, wasn't to attract people. My work was about retaining what I had because they were a commodity, a valuable commodity, and the most valuable commodity we have in town government. In order for us to retain those people, we have to do two things. One, we have to pay them a market rate. We have to pay them a fair market value for the skills they bring to us. And the other thing is you create an environment in which they work, that they get up in the morning and they want to come to work because they enjoy where they work and the work that they do. So that we can control. And I've driven my department heads a little crazy probably, continuing to push that. But the environment is everything. People will work for less money when they can get, make $2 an hour more the next town over. They'll stay in their job because they like where they work. But yes, the increases were salary based in large part. But the salary structure that I restructured that I did in the fall of 21 is in the current budget. So that's the portion you were discussing is the, the, the increases from last year. And the increases from this year, some of that I can, I can go off on tangents on services that we purchase. Our health insurance percentage once went up 30 percent. 20 percent? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to have you talk about those specifics because you pay the bills. But, uh, a lot of our, our costs for services have gone up. There is a direct correlation when you increase salaries that your workers' comp insurance goes up. So there are connections there. So we're mindful of that. We're mindful of these costs. But it is a lot more expensive to try and replace skilled workers than it is to maintain the ones you have. And that's a proven point. And I can't afford to lose the staff that I have. With 18 years in my finance office, Sarah, I don't know how I would replace her. She's one of the top clerks in this state. Todd, two weeks ago, was called by the town manager from Waterbury, asking him if he would please apply for the zoning and planning commission, the zoning and planning position down there. He declined. And it's not because they weren't offering more money, because right now Todd's one of the lowest paid in his field around the state. But it's because he likes where he works, he loves the community he works in, and he loves the work that he does. So, He's continued to stay. If I'm going to retain employees here, and currently we have one vacancy in the entire town, and that's the highway department, and we could have filled that too with somebody that, with, with experience driving a box truck, not who I want behind the wheel of a dump truck. We're being selective, not just filling positions, we're trying to fill them appropriately. <laughs> and I'm going to work hard to keep the environment, one that, that uh, it, it keeps people happy, where there's laughter in the hallways. That's what we like to have when people come in this building, is they hear that. And in order to do that, it costs. And I'm going to tell you right now, I will put our salaries here for any one of the positions up against other municipalities. And we are not above the line. We pay on, we pay on an average at a market rate. We do not pay top salaries in any of these positions. Mr. Cody. <clears throat> We got all these town workers here. I think there's 14, you said? Four, 14 what? 14 uh, on the town crew? There's 13 member, 13 authorized positions. We have 12 people on the town crew. And you're looking for one more? No, no, we, got, we have a vacancy. Tony, so we have, you're gonna hire one more. We're authorized 13 total. We have 12 employees right now. Why don't, why don't we, why don't you ask 
your questions. Well, I'm going to bring my question back to the question before about that town gravel pit. There should have been a road in there a long time ago because it seems to me like the winter's been kind of low and I want to know why these town employees can't build that road. It's not rocket scientists to build a road, especially in a gravel, in a gravel pit. Why do we need to farm it out to somebody and pay all that money? What are these employees doing when it's not snowing? My neighbor patched Cody Hill last week because we cannot get nobody up there to fix the road. Now, I've been complaining about that road since last April with a petition. When are we going to get some gravel to fix that road? I don't have a permit for the Duhamel gravel pit. We cannot. Then why don't we buy some gravel? Yeah, Mr. Dewey. We cannot shovel one bucket full of dirt out of that pit until we have a permit in hand. We cannot build the road until the permit is in hand. The manpower and equipment necessary to cut the trees, clear the stumps, push off the topsoil is beyond what we have in inventory and beyond some of the skills that we have. We could do it, but I'm gonna tell you it'd be a lot more expensive and a lot more time consuming if we did it that way. And meanwhile, there is other things that are happening around the calendar in our highway departments. We can't put the full 12 people on working up at the gravel pit because the village has to have the streets swept. We've got to get ready for the summer sand pile, which we're hoping we're going to get out of our own pit this year. I heard that last year. Yep. I, yeah, I agree. I did. I said that last year. I just my hope. Understood. I don't control yep. the state of Vermont. I don't have a yep. permit yet, Tony. I'm as frustrated as you. We're three years into this process, and it's the longest any municipality has ever had to work in order to get a permit amendment. Yep. Travis Sabatasso. Um, you know, listening to the explanations today, thank you, Eric. Um, I can support paying livable wages. I can support investing in equipment. I can support investing in capital. I can support investing in human resources and in recreation. I can't support how quickly we're doing it. Um, I, I don't sit here and hear anything that sounds unreasonable or anything that the town doesn't need, but the rate of growth over the past two years, a 40% plus budget increase over two years is, is massive. Um, so I question what the long-term planning was. Could, could some of this have been phased in? Could we have done this slower? Looking at just some comparable communities tax rates, um, Stowe is 0 0.4628, and these are municipal only tax rates. Stowe is 0 0.4628 per hundred of assessed value. Waterbury is 0.5334. Cambridge is 0 0.5571. Hyde Park is 0 0.8783. Morristown is currently in the current budget year 1.0543, and we're proposing to increase that by upwards of 30% we are already 20 to 100% higher in our tax rate than the rest of the oil County. I question health insurance. Did we go out to bid? Did we explore alternative options? Did we explore creative plan structure changes to mitigate those costs? I understand health insurance went up. I saw that at my employer, but we did go out to bid. We did try to explore other options. Um, I think the one other thing I just wanted to clarify with Don um, your, your data points there, were those town administrator salaries only that you used for comparison or did that include town manager salaries? Because I do want to say that those are two very different positions. Thank they you. are very different positions and as you know, I base it upon population. And as you also know, town managers work for bigger towns and being the- T 20, Don, can you speak into the microphone? Being the 25th and largest- And speak to me. Being the 25th largest town in Vermont right now, in Morristown that is, uh, comparing our top administrator to a town manager makes an awful lot of sense. Um, and it's probably, probably um, as Judy said, somewhere where this town may want to go in the future. But in my mind, it was about the responsibilities, and the responsibilities are very well correlated with the size of the town. So I would just i would just throw that in there. Okay. I, agree. I do feel that the responsibility. Of the so, I think there are actually a, a, a number of pending 
questions. You asked actually for information about, uh, as I understand it, whether there was uh, thought about phasing in a uh, specific question about health insurance um, and uh, comparison of other tax rates to other communities. So um, if the select board would like to speak to that or whether you'd like to defer to Eric. To I'll speak to one, one section. That is the uh, tax rate in other, count, other towns. Um, I don't know what their history is. I know what our history is here. And our history is that we've kept the line pretty tight for about 10 years. And um, unfortunately, that's coming around right now to kind of bite us because we kept the line so tight and not raising the taxes. And um, I don't know what the other communities are like. You'd have to look, delve back and look at their history to see how they've been budgeting all along. I don't know, maybe Eric can add more to that. Since but that's what I would say about that piece of the question. Uh, I, I've been I've been pretty consistent about how I've been uh, okay. trying to moderate the meeting, um, and uh, so I'd like to stay with them. Anybody have any other comments or questions? Okay. Yes. And then uh, we have somebody on Zoom. Jerry Throne again. Uh, I just want to follow up on the Marstown general uh, government uh, budget. And I'm assuming, uh, don't take this away from my two minutes, I'm assuming that we're going to go through each article. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. we're, we're on the first one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. exactly my point. Second. So I don't want to make comments about another article. Uh, so what I've done is I've drilled down through the expenditures, the total, the 2.9 million, and I'm just looking to see, uh, making comparisons between last year's budget and this year's budget, and some things uh, stick out in me. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and one of them is uh, under town administration, other purchased services, which went from 17,000 to 30,000, which is a 76 percent increase, or six percent of the total 2.9 million. I'm just going to uh, make these comments, and you can address them as you think you should. Uh, town clerk treasurer's office, that total was 8% increase. And I'm only, like I said, I'm only hitting the ones that stand out as large increases. Uh, tax listing. Went from 126 to 137. That's 9% increase. Planning and zoning went from 96,000 to 121%, a 26% increase. <coughs> human resources. I understand we hired human resources person, and that's why there are no budget amounts for. Uh, uh, previous years, and I think that human resources is important, but it's only 3% of the total uh, general government budget, so it's not a huge driving factor. Um, does that mean two minutes is up? Yep. <laughs> I can't finish it, right? I have to sit down. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, you get the idea. Yeah. Anybody yeah. can go through and compare last year to this year. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. On the other portion of services you, uh, you spoke of initially, um, I am in, I've worked with the board um, on our government buildings, and currently our municipal buildings are uh, several of them in pretty rough shape. They aren't necessarily going to meet our needs currently, never mind 30 years from now. So uh, in discussing all of our buildings and the building needs, uh, I have a police station that was built in the early 70s that housed four officers, uh, three officers, and now houses 13 and a half. 13 and a half. Uh, it is completely inadequate the way it stands. There is not uh, nearly enough. There is one processing room. It is, I, I could go on and on, but it, it's not adequate anyway to meet the, today's needs, never mind the needs 30 years down the road. The highway department currently is housed in two separate buildings. One we own, Cochran Road Garage, we own that. We own the property. The one on Old Creamery Road is a leased building. 
and it's a five-year lease with a second five-year lease option. The cost of that is just shy of $100,000 a year for a lease. It's money poorly spent. It's a beautiful facility, but we cannot buy the, the facility itself just because of the way the property is situated. Uh, it belongs to the VAG, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but we can't buy it anymore. So what I propose to the board is that we look uh, at the Cochran Road garage. Uh, the building itself needs a new roof. Uh, it's putting an addition down there would be to bring all of the town's highway equipment, the large equipment, trucks, bucket loaders, graders, have them all housed on the one property. So we're only funding one large structure on the land that we already own and most of the building that we already own, uh, that building just needs a refurbished roof. But to put an addition on down there, it's going to require engineering, it's going to require architectural work, uh, it's going to probably need a job uh, uh, project manager uh, at some level. I'm trying to do as much as I can as I on my own without having to hire somebody like that to do that work. Um, but the fees for that are going to be costly. <coughs> and until I can get the project shovel ready, uh, I really am I'm at loss at applying for grant monies. Uh, I've met with the delegations from Senator Welch, Senator Sanders. Um, I've talked to them about monies from municipal buildings. They've given me some direction uh, for federal funding. Um, Federal earmark. Uh, Senator Sanders has, has talked. His folks have talked to me about that. So, exploring all that is wonderful. But until I get some uh, construction cost estimates, the engineering done, and a plan in place, there's not a whole lot they can help me with. And so that those the other purchase services was an increase in order to facilitate that work. That I can specifically talk about. That explains that. Some of the other things that you talked about are more in line with the town clerk's office. Sarah, I don't know if you want to speak to some of those. <laughs> you said that there's an 8% increase in the town clerk and treasurers. The, the bulk of that is the salaries um, and benefits that are done on the administrative level, not on my level. There's actually, sorry, I'm looking for it. There's um, the page. There's a decrease in election fees in my budget for next year because it's not. Um, it's page 38. Page 38. So the, the bulk of my um, budget is basically the, the salaries and the benefits. Um, the election expenses are lower because it's not a non federal election. Um, year and the state has taken over some of the um, election expenses for federal elections. The dues and subscriptions um, has increased. It's a one-time uh, request. I am currently a certified municipal clerk through the International Clerks Association. There are very few of us in the state of Vermont and I am working to become a master's um, certified clerk. There are there are very very few of those in Vermont, um, and if all goes well, I anticipate receiving that um, next fiscal year. And so there's an in increased cost for that. Also, my assistant Mitzi Fleming has received her certified Vermont clerk certification through the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurer Association. She is working to become a certified. Um, Vermont Treasurer also through the VMCTA and anticipates receiving that hopefully next year. Elizabeth, my other assistant in the office, is currently um, working towards becoming a certified Vermont clerk and anticipates receiving that next year. So um, those are all a one-time expense for next fiscal year that will be reduced after that. And we will be one of the very few um, Clerks Association, I think that has all staff that will be certified either um, on the Vermont level and I'm certified on an international level. Um, the meeting and, and training, training costs more. That's just a, a slight increase um, in training and basically everything else <coughs> in my budget is level funded. And um, before I go back up to the, zoo, the Hollywood squares, for lack of a better, <laughs> um, are there any other 
I, I'm dating myself that I would actually <laughs> say Hollywood Squares. Um, right there with you. You you get two. Jamie. Thank you. So currently in this uh, budget, I believe it's around uh, let's say one hundred thirty thousand dollars for dispatching through the sheriff's department, which is divided equally between the PD, the fire department, and EMS. Um, I'm wondering if by doing so, if fire and EMS are carrying an unfair share burden of that cost due to the number of calls, I'm just making an assumption that the PD takes a majority or a bulk, much more calls than those other two departments. And shouldn't the cost allocation be more equitable based upon the number of calls and the services each individual apartment uh, requires from the sheriff's department. Thanks, Jamie. Do you want Jason to answer that? Jason, can. Jason, why aren't you taking more of that money onto your budget? <laughs> can you speak? Can you come to the microphone, please? I really don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I, it's always been done this way. Yeah, yeah, we split it three ways. We probably do take up more of their time. I think that's a fair assessment but the end cost would remain the same yeah. I think Jamie's just speaking to putting the money into the budgets in places that would more appropriately reflect the call volume Laura Laura Straits I've been asked um, by to ask some questions so uh, but I'm curious also um, first is uh, is there a place where we can view the criteria that the in salary increases uh, were made on what your uh, comparison criteria was? Second question is how, um, why hourly wages in uh, hourly rates instead of annual salaries? Is there an overtime limit at all? And the last is uh, why set gas allowances instead of standard reimbursement? I have to say I've worked for 40 years and always had to do reimbursement. So I think people are wondering why all the departments have gas allowances. Can you answer those? Uh, I have gas allowances. Uh, give me the first one again. Help me, please. My memory is not what it should be. The, the first one was the criteria for wage increases, if I understand it correctly. There is no formal report on that. Uh, I, I tried to explain it as best I could. Uh, in the way that I did the restructure on the, the scale. Um, that I didn't, I don't have any written report. I didn't prevent, present any data. I presented a common sense explanation to the select board uh, to support the, the restructure that I did to the scale. Uh, and, and so that's what I gave. There is no report there. The second question was why hourly instead of annual salaries is overtime limited at all? Good question. Uh, we have in town, we have three employees that are exempt employees, meaning they are not allowed to get overtime or uh, comp time. That's uh, Sarah as a town clerk, myself, and Jason Leno as a police chief. Uh, all the rest are non-exempt employees and are all eligible to receive overtime rates. The overtime is definitely watched by department heads. We try and budget as accurately as we can. Uh, it's done with the police department in particular. They're a heavy overtime agency because the crime doesn't stop at the end of a shift. Um, the, uh, I think there's an average number of hours that we use and then an average rate of pay, overtime pay, is how that number is, is calculated. But Jason has to watch that overtime budget like a hawk and, 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 and does so. So there are times when um, if one of the sergeants is taking a day off, he does not backfill that slot. He leaves that, that shift open. Uh, there, are, there are things that he does to manage his overtime uh, like that. He tries his best to project, but uh, that's, that's what is done, and that's done throughout the departments. Uh, Mother Nature has a say in the highway department to a certain extent. Uh, overtime costs are down this year. Again, we've had, we've had a, a nice winter so far. Um, that's helped our, our budget in, incredibly so. And The third was question was the uh, gas allowances versus standard reimbursement. So. Uh, can I get a clarification on gas allowance? I'm not sure what you're talking about, the gas allowance. We budget for fuels in several of the departments, but I'm not sure what you're talking about, gas allowance. Um, and some folks were reviewing the budget, I don't have the exact place, saw that um, 
there were line items for a $5,000 gas allowance and it was listed as gas allowance and so we they were questioning as to why and I'm sorry I I don't okay. have the exact place yeah so maybe so if you can just I guess say if we don't do gas allowances that would well, I, I can tell you uh, from my standpoint I receive $200 a month uh, as a reimbursement toward the use of my personal vehicle for town business so I, I don't get uh, I don't submit mileage or anything like that I don't submit gas slips I simply receive the $200 and uh, you know I have no reimbursement for insurances it's all on me but it's a $200 a month that's, that's the only thing I'm the only one that gets that employees if they use their personal vehicles for a town function get reimbursed at the IRS rate um, but there is no such thing as gas allowances there is budget items in here for gas and diesel fuel but it's to operate our equipment it's not an allowance for people oh. um, either Mary Ann or Ed Wilson <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would like to stay with general government um, for a, a couple of more questions, if I could. That's Kathy. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Okay. Go, Marianne. Yes. What was it? She, she, she went to ask if she could stay with general budget. And we're still there. Yeah. 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 We're still there, Marianne. I, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, specifically, um, I wondered about on page 39, um, about halfway down the page, there's health insurance and it, and this is under accounting, but, um, it went from 18,000 to 40,000. <laughs> Did health insurance go up a hundred percent? No, it didn't, but we had a change in employees and a change in their benefit, what they chose for benefits. Uh, Paula changed to the HR director position and we hired a new person outside that ch had to, we offered her benefits and she took them. That's the, that's the reason for that. Marianne, Marianne, could you actually ask, just so that I'm consistent with everybody else, what everybody did is if they had a series of questions, they asked them um, and then we'll answer them because otherwise I had cut people off. I want to treat people consistently. I'm not sure what you're asking me, Shep, but I I'm, I'm asking if you can, if you have a series of questions, if you could actually ask them um, entirely okay. because we have a two minute limit and it's hard for us to time it. So if you could ask, all of the questions you have and then we can answer them the next, the next question would be the hra that went from 4800 to 10,000, and then i wondered why uh, computer technology um is up about forty-five thousand. um it seems that one of the questions is uh payroll processing contract and uh, network systems, interactive software, some things there that you know are, are really expensive, and I just wondered what they are, why it's so uh, so much more expensive. Okay. All right. I'll. Um, thanks, Marianne. I'll leave that to. Okay. Um, the first question about the HRA was again the same answer as the last question you asked. It's another employee, uh, employee that was hired that took our benefits and that is a benefit she took which the prior employee did not take. That's the reason for that increase. Um, as far as oh, health reimbursement account. Um, and as far as the interactive software and the payroll processing contract, we have gotten some software for minute taking, which makes things a lot faster, a lot easier, and that's the interactive software along with Zoom, and that's expensive too. Um, the payroll processing contract, our payroll takes probably close to two and a half days to process because it's all manual in terms of adding timesheets. 
And we decided that the best thing to do would be to contract with a payroll processing center that they would, pro it would be all electronic and they would process it and then send it to us for review. And it also will come with a human resources module so we'll be able to uh, computerize our human resources uh, records which are currently not. Uh, this also helps us defray having to hire someone else for a few years, potentially. Um, so that's what that's about. Um, what else was The it? other one was network systems. Network systems? Which was? Yeah, let me look at Right it. near the bottom there. <clears throat> oh, network systems, that is, we have quite a few, we have like three or four computers that need to be replaced. We have a, um, annual licenses for Adobe that we have to now pay for, uh, secure email, uh, all those things cost an annual amount. And in doing you know, the type of work we do, we need the secure email and we need uh, the enhanced Adobe licenses and the managed backup for SimQuest, things like that. And, and replacing computers, they need to be replaced when they you know, and unfortunately we have three that need to be replaced. So that's why that's up as more than it was the year before because we didn't need to replace them then. Okay. Right. Are there other questions from the floor? Yes. Hi, Evelyn Throne. Um, first of all, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to, um, reflect on something that someone else said and uh, ask if this is correct. They had talked about the disparity or, or the, the, the graph of, of tax rates between the different towns. Um, my feeling, my question is, is this, uh, say, they, you know, they said compared to other towns, say Stowe has a lower tax rate. I, my feeling is that that is because uh, the properties are worth a lot more, so that the lower tax rate actually brings in more money. So it, first of all, is that correct? Um, second of all, uh, there was two other, uh, two other increases I'd like to ask about. The uh, Morrisville Centennial Library increased uh, the budget a lot, um, and also the uncompensated Absences for absences for retirees. If you could describe both of those, so there were three things. Sure, I can speak to the library first and foremost. So the library gives us an appropriation request every year, uh, and that's that we don't bill that. That's brought to the select board. They uh, discuss it. The library does a presentation to them every year, uh, explaining how uh, in their increases. Uh, this year we increased from I think the funding last year was in the 56 to 57 percent of their operating budget this year it went up to about 75 percent. Uh, there were some changes made as they explained to us in the policies they have surrounding the expenditures from their uh, endowment fund uh, such that they were spending out of the principal balance uh, thereby lowering the amount of money is that can be made uh, of their investments uh, so that they they eliminated some of those through policy such that uh, the money they have in their operations account, basically their operations uh, investments, um, was less money than they had been putting forth before. So they, uh, the, it was a cost shift, basically, um, and a request for a higher appropriation uh, from us, uh, from the taxpayers, I should say. The uncompensated absences. So uncompensated absences. So Tina has to forecast staff members throughout the town that are eligible to retire. And when they do retire, uh, we have to have monies available in order to pay for their uh, earned time off, accumulated earned time off. It's a state law requires us to pay those things out. Um, so that's, uh, she's projected those out, uh, I think over the next three years. Yeah. There are approximately 10 to 12 employees that are eligible now that doesn't mean they're going to retire but we can't we can't force them to tell us that they're going to but what we can do is put money aside in order to have it available such that the budget doesn't go crazy up and down tina has figured it out uh, on a, a decreasing 
percentage basis as to how much we will need every year for the next few years in order to fund that uh, and have enough money to pay those um, pay those employees their their due when they retire. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there was a third question. I'm sorry. The tax rates. The tax rates. The tax rates. Towns. Tax rates are. Tax rates are set. Grandlist does play in that. It's total value of properties in town, but it's really about your budget. So you need to raise X amount of dollars to cover the cost of running your government. When you have your grand list, it's so many cents against that grand list that raises that, that money for the budget. The larger the grand list, the lower the tax rate. You don't need as large a tax rate to raise the same amount of money. So in comparing the town's tax rates, it's, it can be difficult sometimes to do the apples and oranges comparison because every town in the state has a different grand list. Um, and we have different community makeups. So Cambridge has a ski area, but they are not so. Comparing two towns because they both have ski areas wouldn't be fair because Cambridge doesn't have the grand list that Snow does. So even though they each have their each resort towns, those two comparisons may not work. So uh, there, there is a, a correlation between the size of your grand list and the, the size of your tax rate. <coughs> Are there other questions on this particular article? Because if not, we can move on to the next one. Please. Yes. Please. No, I. We're here. We're here for as long as it takes. Yes. Great. <coughs> Start the time clock. Number one, has you have a lot of confidence in this report that you have pushed out here, right? The board. Yes or no? Number two, has anyone looked at the review report of the auditor's certification? Yes. Yes. Okay. So can you ask all the questions? It's just uh, so that I, I, I get, can. Uh, number three question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, would you please qualify whether on page 24, uh, <clears throat> I add up the totals of all of these columns. And I get 120.8% increase. That's a question. You can answer them all at once. On page 47, does the town bookkeeper here have an actual number, so the number of dollars that have been spent for the actual 20, I guess 20, 20, 2, 23 years of uh, monies that have been spent to date to today, because if it's a bookkeeper, they should know how much the town's actually spent. I'd like that number. And then if I look at this same report on page 47, and I take the, at the bottom, I see the operating budget where you talk about it. I see one column that says 34%, and the other column of this year that they're proposing a 52%. So that means, or that tells me, does it not, yes or no, that these years, which are, I guess, two years, tell me that the budget is proposing to go up 86%. The 34% that it actually did and then 52% you're just saying it's going to. So we're looking at an 86% increase there. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Could you identify yourself? Uh, David Ring. Okay. Thanks. Do I stay up here for answers? You can, no, you don't have to. You're done. <laughs> I, I'll call, I, first of all, I'm done. I don't even know what question was asked, honestly. I'm sorry. I, I, there so was the first, made about I think the first question that you – let's go reverse order. The first question uh, dealt with um, page 47 with regard to operating budget and then to be raised. And the question was, do you add the 34 plus 52, and does that equal 86? And so I think maybe you could explain 
what those columns are about. Go ahead. The operating budget column, as you could, it says proposed 2324, and that's the $2.9 million figure. Then FY 2223, that's a $2.2 million figure. The difference being $752,000, which is a 34% increase from one year to the next. It doesn't have anything to do with the next column, which says taxes to be raised. So the taxes to be raised is not the same as the operating budget because we do get income that, are, that taxpayers don't need to pay. If we get the income, then it obviously reduces the amount that we're going to have to get raised by taxes. So you don't add the two together. So, I think the other, one of the other questions that I heard was on page 24. Um, I believe that the um, vote, voted percentage of change, if you totaled it, would equal 128 Eight. 120.8%. Excuse me, 120.8. Um, and the question was, I, I took the question to be, is that consistent with the number that is um, the percentage increase for the total operating budgets? So if you could maybe, Tina, explain that, I think. I don't know where. I, I believe that he totaled all of those numbers. You, oh. you, you list as each one of these is the individual entity. The govern, government, general yep. government is 52 percent. Yep. The police department is 20 percent. They're each individual. So if you take each individual one, then then you come up with 120.8 percent increase. Yep. But, yeah, that's that's not how we're, how we're doing it. What I'm trying to illustrate there is for each individual division, the difference the increase in percentage from one year to the next. You can't add them all up to, to get a figure. That's not what that's intended for. It's intended to let you know that general government's up 52%, police is up 20%, uh, fire's up 3.9%, EMS is 0.3%. They're all individual. You can't add all the percentages up to get a dollar amount. So I think if you look at the operating I'm stepping a little bit out of my lane here, but if you look at the operating base budgets and you total the 2021 to 22, and I believe that should be 22 to 23. Right. So as an average, you're talking 30.8%. That's, That's right. Right, right. Yeah. okay, all right. Uh, and then I think you asked about the auditor's uh, report as well. Right. Yep. We responded. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm going to move on to article number two, or no, no, excuse me, article number four, yeah, we just did that. Article five, shall the voters authorize the construction of sidewalks to Jersey Way, any remaining balance should be used for sidewalk operating expenses in amount not to exceed $200,000 to be financed over a period not to exceed five years. Would anybody? Uh, like to uh, explain that so that I, I would love to so article 5 as we've uh, advertised as well there'd be more discussion on this going forward chap uh, mm -hmm. when the article was put into the uh, the report uh, it got by all of us that the address the location of the sidewalks being built mm -hmm. in the article was Jersey Way and that is not where the sidewalks are intended to be built it is Jersey Heights so we called our municipal law attorney and consulted with him informing him that we also had a special meeting coming in april where we could bring this topic back up if there wasn't a way of correcting it in the current town report his indication to us was you're in uncharted waters if you try and correct it and continue to vote on it the way it's written because it's not written correctly <clears throat> the more legal way to do it would be to nullify this article 5 for the australian ballot and bring it back before the voters during the special floor meeting in April. That's, that's the background behind that. What I'll talk to you about is the project the $200,000 goes toward. From uh, roughly uh, the, the base of uh, below Mike Alexander's house, the big greenhouse in the gully below the police department. If everybody knows that reference, we can move up from there. Uh, you have Feline Loop that comes out just below Mike's house. From Feline Loop up through, there is something we call a sidewalk, but it is not a sidewalk. Um, 
and from there out to Bishop Marshall School or the bridge that goes underneath uh, the truck route, there is a patchwork of sidewalks. The patchwork is a result of development. So as these projects, uh, Mr. Mink's project on top of Jersey Heights, uh, the condominium project, which is beside the Irving Station to the left of it that hasn't started yet, but they raised the old, the old farmhouse there. Uh, Mr. Mink's project on the other side of the Irving toward the Bishop Marshall School. All of those projects are being required to build sidewalks in front of their properties. So there will be a patchwork of new sidewalks throughout there that will be paid for by the developers, not by the taxpayers. But there will be left a gap from approximately the Jersey Way intersection down uh, along that side of the road. Uh, there's a short section that needs to go in. If you're familiar with the, the four beautiful silver maple trees that are in front of one of the houses down there, uh, we don't want to disrupt those. What we have done is uh, we've got a plan in place. The road is wide enough there for us to put the sidewalk in without disrupting those trees or the root systems and put a crossing there that will go across to where the sidewalk currently ends, which is brand new sidewalk, uh, from the Mink Project. It's right by the end of the guardrail. We're basically filling in the holes between where the developers have already built sidewalks such that we have a continuous ribbon of sidewalk out to the underpass at the truck route. Currently, we, we don't, as a practice, plow sidewalks that aren't connected. So that's why those sections of sidewalk are not plowed this winter because we don't, we don't do that. We don't do it anywhere in town unless they're actually connected. So. Uh, the $200,000 is the estimate for the cost of filling in the gaps in the sidewalks that currently exist. Questions about Article 4? Tom. Five, excuse me, Article 5. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, I like it. You know, the budget being as high as it is, do we really need that sidewalk? this year and can the select board or yourself or whoever just take article five and say we'll we'll see you maybe next year that's two hundred thousand dollars on top of what we're going to be paying <clears throat> it just seems crazy at this time we're doing spending all this time on on patchwork sidewalks and my response to you is, is simply that this isn't a part of our annual maintenance it's a project in itself so that's why we don't incorporate it into our budget we have monies for sidewalk repair uh, in our budget uh, proposed for next year, but this is a project for building new sidewalks and it has a substantial price tag. And because it's not a part of our normal budget, it's an extra item, we give it to the taxpayers to make that very decision that you're talking about. Is it something we need now or not? And that's the question that's before you on the ballot. Mr. Cody. <clears throat> I walked sidewalks of Waterbury for 35 years. They were bad, real bad. They, they redid it when they redid all Main Street and I'd retired. They looked great, but Morristown can't afford this. Mm -hmm. Especially Dave Cheney is the only one that walks out that way. And it was an Eden now. Okay, so think about that. <laughs> A couple of runners. I think we can wait until next year. You do know Dave Cheese is in Eden now, though, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr. Campbell. Hey, on the sidewalk, uh, you're saying the developer has got to pay in front of the structures. And if, if you leave it, <clears throat> only with those patchworks, as you call it. What about the one on Route 100, just beyond the Morristown Corners Road? How ridiculous that looks. That apartment house or whatever it is there was built, they were made to put in this sidewalk in the middle of nowhere. So does that mean you're gonna continue the sidewalks all the way up past Morristown Corners uh, Road? I mean, it, it just seems ridiculous. Uh, you know, how many people are going to use this sidewalk for two hundred thousand dollars? And as Tom said, you know, the budget that we have is way out of line. 
I don't think that requires a response. Any other questions on Article 5? Seeing none, Article 6, shall the voters authorize the purchase of an ambulance and power stretcher in an amount not to exceed 335000 to be financed over a period not to exceed five years? So it, I could have uh, Bill Mapes, our EMS chief, speak to this. He knows the, the particulars on the ambulance. I'll probably get the year wrong if I try and quote it. I do know this is an ambulance that while I was on the select board, uh, we purchased used. The ambulance at the time that we were replacing was not inspectable. Uh, we were in a crunch for a second vehicle. And this is one we found that was refurbished out of the Rutland area. And it already had a lot of miles on it. But we knew we could get uh, a good period of time out of it for use. So tell more, more about the ambulance we're replacing and then the ambulance that we're looking to purchase. Sure. So, uh, um, can you speak oh, to the microphone? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a face radio, so it's... <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you might want to yeah, actually turn around. Turn, 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 around, around. Yeah. turn, turn around to, to me. Yeah. No, turn to the monitor. Turn to me. Talk You're to speaking oh, to the monitor. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, the educator in me says I have to talk to the class. So, uh, so, um, so like Eric alluded to, um, uh, we, uh, in 2019, uh, 2019, when I came on board, uh, we were faced with an ambulance uh, that was a 2008 that was no longer inspectable. Um, we came to the select board with a plan to buy a used ambulance uh, that was purchased uh, from a busy service in Rutland. Uh, currently, it is a 2013, so it's 10 years old, with 137,000 miles on it. Um, Prior to my arrival here, there was a plan put in place to replace an ambulance every five years. Uh, so the, ne the newest ambulance we have was purchased in 2018. So 2023 keeps us on budget and on target for replacing ambulances on a five-year timetable. Uh, the one that we're replacing is the one that was purchased, used in 2019, that currently has 137,000 miles on it. It's 10 years old, doesn't have the most current safety technology to keep our crews and patients safe, doesn't have uh, the, uh, the load system uh, that keeps our crews safe and reduces uh, uh, workplace injuries and, and workman cop claims, which I'm proud to say with the ambulance that we purchased in 2018, since we've had that power load system, we've had no stretcher related uh, uh, workman's comp claims uh, or patient uh, uh, patient injuries or crew injuries with that uh, with the installation of that power load system. Um, the ambulance, uh, the actual particulars on the uh, ambulance that we're looking at is an identical twin to the ambulance that we currently purchased in 2018, which is now our primary truck. Um, twinning the vehicles allows us to have the same equipment in the same place every time for every call for every patient. There's no second guessing about what's in what cabinet. Um, so we're twinning the truck uh, that we purchased in 2018. Uh, the difference between that truck and this truck is that we've, uh, we've had to go to a Chevrolet chassis due to the, uh, uh, the poor ability uh, to get Ford chassis, which is typically what an ambulance would be built on. So we've gone to a Chevrolet chassis for this one. Uh, in 2018, that ambulance was, I wasn't here for that, but that ambulance was $280,000. This ambulance that we're looking at comes in at 299644 for the ambulance and chassis. Uh, the remaining part of that uh, is uh, $32,000 for the new stretcher that has to go in with the new ambulance. The stretcher from the current old ambulance is not adaptable uh, to the new ambulance. Uh, we are unfortunately beholden to a couple of things. We're, uh, we're beholden to the USDOT uh, Triple K1822F uh, standards on automotive ambulances, and we're also beholden to the NFPA 1917 standards on automotive ambulances. Uh, those standards uh, alone account for a large portion of the quote on that ambulance. Um, I, there's very few frills or anything else that we've added to that ambulance uh, other than your basic type one ambulances defined by Triple K, 1822F, and 1917 from NFPA. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Questions or comments on Article 6?
Travis Sabatasso. Um, just in looking at the town's capital plan, sorry, I don't have it printed out here, so looking at it on my phone, looks like we've got 37.5 going in this year for capital replacement for ambulances, 75,000 in FY25, 75,000 sort of going forward. Um, is there any money existing currently in the capital plan for the replacement of an ambulance? I guess, why are we going out for a bond vote for the entire cost of that? Has any of that been planned for via capital? Well, it's not a bond vote. It's just going to be a bank loan. Sorry. But we have to we have to pay the money up front. The thirty thirty seven thousand dollars that you were seeing in there that is the payments on the ambulance that we will make, and that's why you saw them that way. So even though you are voting for a three hundred thirty five thousand dollar ambulance, really, if it goes through, you'll only be paying thirty seven thousand dollars roughly on it in the budget year of twenty three twenty four because that's the payment amount. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay. Any other questions, Tony? I'd like to see the town buy three new ambulances for you, but I'd also like to see the town divide this EMS crew by all the other towns that use it equally. That means if it's a million dollars here, it's a million dollars in Elmore. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> yes, Trav. Travis Sabatasso. So I'm going to piggyback Tony a little bit. Um, I guess for starters, how many communities does our EMS service provide service coverage to? I understand mutual aid, but who are we the primary service area service coverage provider for? Um, and how do we determine what funding we get from other communities? I, I don't have the exact number here, but I think Elmore gives us like 20, 30,000. Um, is that based on per capita? Is that based on call volume? How, how is that figure determined as well as for any other communities? Can someone speak to that? I can speak to the, the amount that the, or the primary ambulance responses for more so on Elmore only. Those are primary. Elmore does pay us a subscription fee. Uh, we took that from $24,000 that they've been paying for the last four or five years uh, without increase. Um, it was proposed to go up to 35000 They asked if we would split it in half for the two years, this year and next year. So uh, the select board agreed to do a $30,000 subscription for this year, $35,000 for the following budget year. Um, that dollar figure, I, what I did was took the cost of living adjustments from 18 to 24 since their last, uh, it was an increase to 24,000. And I figured out what the cost of living adjustments were and applied that to the $24,000 mark, came up to the 35,000. Um, it, as I explained to them, this, this money we received from them isn't about cost of response, it's about cost of readiness. So buying the tires, changing the oil, the, the supplies in the back, that's what the subscription money does. And it guarantees that when someone from Elmore calls 911, the Morristown Ambulance will be the one to respond to their residents. The response is, in part, the recovery from that expense is through insurance billing. It doesn't mean every call that we go on, someone either has insurance or that they get transported. We have some no transport calls as well. But currently, there's only just more still taxpayers and uh, the Elmore residents who pay a subscription fee. The rest of the community's uh, bill has put out a response, annual response, uh, we respond to other communities based on an EMS district, uh, and that's through a mutual aid process. I can tell you that we were just authorized by the select board to begin billing those communities when they do a request for a paramedic intercept. Uh, we have never done that before. We have paid those out to another agency before, um, but it has become um, more prevalent because we have five paramedic, six paramedics on our annual service right now. It's uh, for the size of the service, it's a pretty incredible amount. Um, so we're gonna be billing those out at $250 per call. We are also looking uh, at developing, we are trying to figure out the best and most fair way to do this is a billable uh, amount to a community where their primary ambulance coverage isn't requesting an additional ambulance, mutual aid, but because of a lack of staffing, they don't have any coverage at the time. To us, it's not mutual aid, that's primary coverage. So we are trying to develop a common sense and, and fair system of reimbursing our costs because many of those times, 
there are no transports, but we're going to communities, Johnson, Hyde Park, Eden. Um, those, they all uh, subscribe to an ambulance service, but sometimes those ambulances are on transports from hospital to hospital aren't available. That's not mutual aid. That's a lack of primary coverage, and so we, we feel we should be reimbursed for those. So we're, we're working on that. So we'll move on to Article 7. Shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the unallocated reserve fund to replace both the general fund and allocated reserve fund and the highway fund unallocated reserve fund in an amount not to exceed 10% of the prior year's operating budget be used for covering unanticipated revenue shortfalls and to pay unanticipated expenditures in accordance with 27 VSA 2804. Information regarding the reserve funds questions is in Article 7 through 9 and is on pages 27 through 28 of the town report. Anybody want to speak to that? So Article 7 through 9, uh, you've seen these before uh, on in previous town meetings. We're not requesting funding for these funds. What we're requesting is a, our attorney again has said, officially you need to have your voters legitimize the funds and recognize them through a voted town meeting so that is what this is these funds have existed we've run which one this is the unallocated reserve right we so don't have any money anymore. there's no money in the fund but we're, right. we're the fund is being created officially we're asking for the recognition from the voters to identify this as an authorized fund and the monies placed in there would come from overages, reserve or money left over at the end of the budget year in a common combination of both highway and general government. Prior to this year, we had to separate those dollars. The legislature said you couldn't mingle highway funds with your general government operations funds if you had money left over at the end of the year. They've, re they've taken that away now. You can mingle those monies to make only one reserve fund. And those are the monies that we call the undesignated reserves. The select board would reach to those during a time of uh, environmental crisis. We just talked recently about the, the Halloween storm of 2019 and the reimbursements we received uh, from FEMA and the state uh, as a result of that. And uh, we finally got full payment on those. But it's those all unallocated reserves that are used at a time of that rather than diving into the current and existing budget because it was 430 something thousand dollars was the total expense uh, of that storm to the town of Morristown. And we recovered all the 32,000 of it, I believe, from the state and the feds. So this is the fund with the money. Uh, any monies left over would go into this not to exceed 10% of the previous year's operating budget. Correct. Mm -hmm. Was that pretty good? Yeah, that's pretty good. Any questions about Article 7? Okay, Article 8 is um, shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the Municipal Building Capital Reserve Fund to be used for the purpose of the construction or improvement of municipal buildings and deposit approximately $988,887.37 from the general fund surplus created from former ARPA funds to fund this reserve fund in accordance with 24 VSA Section 2804. Again, this is uh, looking to create a fund, have the, the voters legitimize it by voting to authorize its existence. This, these monies already exist. They're in an investment account at Edward Jones. And once the fund is recognized by the voters, the money will be transferred into that fund. Um, for And it's called the Municipal Building Capital Reserve Fund. As I, described earlier, uh, I'm talking about our police department, our highway department. Um, we saw that this money would probably do us best if we used it for many different things, but matching funds uh, for grants uh, and, and primary funds for some purchases, but toward uh, getting our municipal buildings in a condition that will last us beyond the foreseeable five years. We're looking to get the 30 to 50 year life out of these. So. Mm -hmm. Questions about Article 8. Article 9 
Shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the Bridge and Highway Infrastructure Reserve Fund to be used for the purposes of the construction or improvement of bridges and highway infrastructure and deposit approximately 306,450 42 cents from the current bridge account to fund this reserve fund in accordance with 24 BSA section 2804. This money currently exists. Again, it is legitimizing and recognizing the voters recognizing that the fund exists so this money can stay in there. We're not asking for any new monies. Every year in our budget, we have a $30,000 line item to go into this account. It helps us to defray costs as bridges need repair. Um, so that's that we're, we're again asking for the voters to support this legitimizing the fund in its existence. Questions? Article 10, shall the voters authorize raising taxes equal to one cent on the grand list, approximately $67,757 to be dedicated to a Morristown Fire Department Capital Equipment Fund? Any questions? Yes, Tom. The one cent of the grand list, I think, that, is that equal to 27 cents? What does that one cent mean? Not for the well, fire. Uh, what's the value for that? What, the one, what does the one cent mean? Yeah. What is it raised? The grand list. I think it was 27 cents or something. What is that figure? Do you know? Well, we. We won't know until the grand list is lodged. That's why this is an approximate amount. So, it's in the article. It raises approximately sixty-seven thousand seven hundred fifty-seven dollars. Using one, one cent of on the grand list raises that amount. Okay. Yep. Any other questions on Article Ten? Article 11 asks, shall the voters authorize raising taxes equal to one cent on the grand list, approximately $67,757, to be dedicated to a Morristown Highway Department <laughs> Capital Equipment Fund? Any questions about this one? Article 12, shall the voters authorize raising taxes equal to one half sent on the grand list approximately $33,879 to be dedicated to the Noise House Museum Repair and Maintenance Fund. Questions? Okay. Article 13, shall the voters authorize raising taxes equal to one half cent on the grand list approximately $33,879 to be dedicated to the Morristown Conservation Commission Fund. Questions? Article 14, shall the voters authorize raising taxes equal to one half cent on the grand list, approximately 33,879, to be dedicated to the Bridge and Highway Infrastructure Reserve Fund? Questions? Article 15, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $900 for the support of Capstone Community Action to provide services to residents of the town? Questions? Okay. Article 16, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and, appropriate and expend the sum of $2,900 for the support of Central Vermont Adult Basic Education to provide services to residents of the town. Questions about that? Article 17, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $2,500 for the support of Central Vermont Council on Aging to provide services to residents of the town? Questions, Tony? I want to know if these appropriations committees and all these people that put in for this money, are they going to be able to, are they going to be required to come in maybe to at least three meetings? We have in the past done this before COVID. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but we have them coming to our meetings 
and uh, on a rotation rotating basis and that's so not good enough they're not being responsible enough they're asking for money we're giving them money most of the time so that's i thought i answered your question okay sorry I just to back up what Judy's saying at the last select board meeting, the select board did suggest that all these social services groups that are coming to the town for appropriations, that they give at least one presentation every year. Mm -hmm. And that was mostly because Capstone gave the presentation that night and it was an outstanding presentation for those of us that were here. Okay. Yes. One quick one quick question. One yep. Thing. Come on up. I'm still on trying to understand the budget and I get confused with some things. Where does this money um, become appropriated or where does it fit into the budget? Because we, we, we talked about voting on the, the general one which is Eight million, but then you've got all these other articles. Where does it actually come into the equation? If you look on page 25 of your town report, you'll see a line that says service agencies. That's what these appropriations are, other than the ones that are above that were new appropriations. Service. It's 86,969. That, that's what they all are with the exception of the two above that, Salvation Farms and Lamoille Health Partners. Those are brand new so that they're listed separately here. If you look on page 25 at the bottom of that page. So, so then that, that, that increases that 30.8% which 30.8% which is on page 24, correct? Because that's not associated with it, correct? Well if, well, if you go to page 26, the top of page 26, what you're asking is how much is the increase correct. in taxes? 28.2%, that includes everything, social service agencies, and if all the bills were to pass, that's the increase that you will see. So it decreases at 30.8% or that, that just No, it does, it does decrease it. It does decrease it, varying different things. Um, for example, on page 25, you can see where it says paving Australian ballot 104,700 for the prior year. We're not asking for that this year. So that decreases things. So you have to compare the two columns. And so, in the end, the service agencies are decreasing 14.7% because a, uh, a service agency that requested money in the prior year is not requesting it. I got it. I got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and Tina, just that 28.8% isn't... Taxes aren't going up 28.8%. No, no. Taxes are, that's the amount of the increase, 28.2%. So the next uh, uh, the next article is Article 18. Shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars for the support of Clarina Howard Nichols Center, to provide services to residents of the town? Any questions? Article 19. Shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $1,000 for the support of justice for dogs to provide services to residents of the town? Questions? Article 20. Shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $2,500 for the support of the Lamoille County Civic Association to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 21, shall the town of Morestone vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $5,000 for the support of the Moyle County Food Share to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? <coughs> 
Article 22, shall the Town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of thousand of thousand dollars to support the Lamoille County Habitat for Humanity to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 23, shall the Town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $3,900 for the support of Lamoille County Mental Health Community Connections to provide services to residents of the town. Questions or comments? Article 24, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $3,375 for the support of the Lamoille County Special Investigation Unit to provide services to residents of the town? Are there questions or comments about that particular item? Article 25, shall the Town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $4,000 for the support of Lamoille Day Services to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 26, shall the Town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $4,000 for the support of Lamoille Economic Development Council to provide services to residents of the town. Questions or comments? Article 27, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $3,000 for the support of Lamoille Family Center to provide services to residents of the town? Are there questions or comments? Article 28, shall the Town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $15,000 for the support of Lamoille Health Partners Community Center to provide services to residents of the town? Are there questions or comments? Chef. Yes. Yeah. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. She's muted. You're muted. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So I have a question on Article 28 um, for the Lamoille Health Partners Community Center, and I don't see a report in the um, in the town report that tells us what they do. I I don't know if they're operating or not. And if they are, what are they doing? And the reason that I ask the question is because on Article 29, they're asking for about the same amount of money. And on page 110, there's a very detailed description of what Lamoille Health, Home Health and Hospice provides. So my question is, how do we know what this Health Partners is doing? I can uh, introduce the CEO of Lamoille Health Partners who's in the audience tonight, Stuart May, if we'd like to have him come up and describe what they do. Yep. They're a brand new appropriation this year. Okay. Uh, they have assumed services actually increased and rebranded, rechanged. Uh, from personal experience, my granddaughters attend there. Uh, he can speak to their programming and what they're doing and what the money is used for. Okay. I'd also like to say they did a presentation to the select board this year. They did. Okay. Uh, Mr. May, would you like to get your two minutes to describe. Less. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good evening, Stuart May, uh, Lamoya Health Partners. Um, as uh, Eric mentioned uh, previously in prior budgets, the community center operated as E equals MC squared, which was uh, funded by the taxpayers earlier in 2022. We took over the center that had closed to continue to pro provide services and expand services for the residents of uh, Morristown. Excuse me. Um, actually made two presentations, uh, came and, and told the select board about uh, the purchase of those assets, what we intended to do, and then followed up with what was uh, executed during the year. The money will go towards helping to offset the operating expenses. We don't charge for any of the services and currently run three different programs out of there. There's an after school program for fifth through 12th graders. Um, last uh, academic year, approximately 82 students use those services. 
Um, we provide uh, space for our seniors. Currently, once a week, uh, there is a table, table tennis group uh, using the facility. We're uh, working with both the UVM Elder Services group along with the uh, Council on Aging to expand and bring additional free services for our seniors um, during 2023. And thirdly, it partnered with uh, Lamoya South School District for their life skills program. Um, and those students come over and use the center to uh, expand some of their teachings. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Laura. Uh, Laura Streets, just a clarification. Um, having been involved in, at, at that particular meeting um, and looking at the 2022 annual report, was there not 15,000 that was transferred from E equals MC squared to these folks last year? It's, it, and it's not listed in here, neither EMC square or, so I'm just curious why $15,000, what happened? Sure, in, in the purchase of those assets, the $15,000 was transferred to us and was used to offset the operating expenses. Uh, the operating expenses were about 95,000 for last fiscal year, so, um, that 15000 was used against that $80,000 um, was covered by this. We were not uh, asked, nor was I aware, to submit a report, but happy to do that in uh, retrospect to, uh, to the town. Okay. Yes, Laura. So I'm unclear as to why it's not listed in the 2000 22 annual report appropriations somewhere just curious I, so i do the appropriations and all that reaches out to folks and uh my understanding is that the tap, the reports there are folks that usually get an appropriation anyone that's new coming to the town for an appropriation and you don't need to get a report from them so that's why there isn't one there but it was e equals mc square didn't ask them for one because they no longer exist. But there's still fifteen thousand dollars that's not allocated in here. Is all I'm saying. Can okay. someone clarify whether fifteen thousand dollars that was appropriated in last year's budget was actually paid to Lamoille Health Partners and was transferred from an allocation that was originally going to go to EL, EL, E equals MC squared and why it is not in the budget? Thank you. In, in the budget documents um, as voted last year at town meeting they voted to pay 15,000 to ee equals mc squared and they were paid the 15,000 like everybody else that was voted to get that money it's my understanding from what stuart just said that that money was then transferred to them when they bought the uh you know bought the um yeah the, the whole thing so it's not in there because for one they don't exist anymore there's nobody to give us a report but the 15,000 was used for the purpose of which it was intended no matter who the recipient of that was yes Tony they don't exist no more you just said that all I asked earlier was why can't we have these people come in here every quarter that's January, February, March, April, May, June. Why can't they come in here once every quarter? Is, is that asking too much? You're talking $15,000 here. Okay. I, think, I think your question is a rhetorical one. Um, so, but I, it's a question that's addressed to the select board and I think they can take it under advisement. Any other questions? Article number 29, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $15,681 for the support of Lamoille Home Health and Hospice to provide services to residents of the town. Are there any questions or comments about that?
Article 30, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $1,000 for the support of Lamoille Housing Partnership to provide services to residents of the town? Are there any questions or comments about that? Article 31, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $1,500 for the support of the Lamoille Restorative Center to provide services to residents of the town? Any questions or comments? Article 32, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $10,000 for the support of Meals and Wheels of Lamoille County to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 33, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $1,000 for the support of North Country Animal League to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 34, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expand, expand the sum of $1,000 for the support of Retired Senior Volunteer Program to provide services to residents of the town? Any questions or comments? Article 35, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $10,000 for the support of River Arts to provide services to residents of the town? Questions or comments? Article 36, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $10,000 $963 for the support of rural community transportation to provide services to residents of the town. Questions or comments? Article 37, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $2,500 for the support of Salvation Farms to provide services to residents of the town. Questions or comments? Teresa? Um, Teresa Snow is Salvation Farms, um, the founder of the organization. Um, we're most known for our work in gleaning here in the Lamo County. Um, gleaning is the act of reaping after the harvest, and what we do is we work with local farms. Um, we engage volunteers. We collect what the farms can't sell, whether they've harvested it or not, and then we uh, distribute that product to local food sites. Um, some numbers, this last year we collected over 82,000 pounds of food from local farms, um, almost 50 different local farms, uh, with the help of 183 volunteers who gave us about 750 hours. Um, and we moved that food to more than 50 different community food programs. We also moved more than 1,200 dozen eggs, loaves of bread, pounds of meat, um, cheese, uh, seeds, plant starts. Uh, specifically here in Morrisville last year, uh, we distributed more than 20,000 pounds, uh, equaling um, more than 60,000 servings uh, to a number of different agencies, including Lamoille Health Partners, Lamoille Community Food Share, Lamoille County Mental Health Services, their food shelf. Lairway Youth and Family Services that probably serve some of our town's residents. Um, Meals on Wheels of Lamoille County, The Manor, The WIC Program, Copley House, the United Community Church of Morseville, and Morseville Out and About. Thank you. This is our first request. Thank you. Other comments and questions? Yes. Um, hi, Evelyn Throne. Uh, yeah, I, it's basically a comment. I've been volunteering with Salvation Farms for most of the time I've been here, and I'm not as familiar with the other organizations, but I'm very familiar with them. And I think it's really interesting to think about how, in some ways, the food that that is collected, that it would go to compost, or it would be, uh, just, you know, just sit and rot in the fields, or it would get discarded. It, it helps to support the other organizations that are asking for money and are around here. And uh, I think something she didn't say was that the farmers are also very grateful because they don't have to deal with these, this food that's going to waste. They feel better about it. Um, and it's, it's an incredible um, 
volunteer opportunity <laughs> for anybody who wants it for a little plug there. But uh, I think it's a very worthy organization and I hope that it gets support uh, because it is growing and um, you know, it's looking to process food even so that it can be given out more easily. There are homeless people who can't necessarily process this food or people who don't have limited facilities to, to do it. So to process some of this will be very helpful too. So they're, they're just branching out and, and very worthwhile. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Tom. Thank you. I appreciate it. First of all, thank you for all the information you're putting out to us. Uh, uh, I know it's a lot of difficult questions coming all at once. It helps clarify a lot. Uh, one thing that didn't go away was the fact that the budget is way, way too high. It's, it's two years, 12%, then 28% over two years is is crazy. Do I just still have so to? So are you are that? you speaking to Article Thirty Seven? No. Okay. <laughs> Can I continue? And then I then I don't have to get up later. Well, so Article Thirty Seven is the last one. Okay. The comments around the budget. We're, we're doing information, and the comments were on each individual yeah. article, and um, so the the comments that you're making were appropriate to be addressed during the budget. Section. Okay. Can I ask one question? Then? This would be if this, when this budget fails and it comes back to you, what is the process? What do we go through then when the budget fails and it comes back? All this stuff fails. What do you do? What do you do then? I'll leave that to. Hmm? Can I explain the election side, not the budget side? You care about that. Uh, of course, I know, you know, this is a, this budget for this town, as far as we know, has never not passed. So it's new, new character. I want to do 37 stuff. What's that? <laughs> yeah, let's do 37 stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I know everybody thinks I'm bad, but you know what? I worked with a food shelf my whole career in the post, in the post office in Waterbury. And what that young lady just did right there, she, she, she should be commended for coming up here, and like I'm asking all the other of these appropriations to come here once a quarter and tell them why they need the money. And they just might get some money. I haven't filled out my ballot yet. Most of my ballot says zero, no. But she's getting a yes from me. So maybe we can, um, are there any other questions on Article 37? And then, and then maybe what we can do is actually have uh, a summary of what happens on town meeting day and then um, subsequent, uh, if anything is necessary after town meeting day, how that, how that happens, okay? How's that sound, Tom? Okay, everybody okay with that? So are we okay with 37? Have we heard enough? Okay. All right, so maybe we could have somebody explain, well, we know that we're going to have a, a vote on March 7th. Is it 7th? Yes. Yeah, March 7th. Yeah. As is always the case when we vote on things, things can pass or things can fail. And so I think the question that you asked, Tom, was what happens if the budget or actually other um, items in the town uh, on the ballot fail. You know what's right. confusing? The budget fails, and then all those articles that wanted money. What happens to that? That's I mean, a, what happens? That's 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 a good question, and thankfully I don't have to answer it. So, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the development of a new budget if the budget will fail, but I'll talk about the articles. So if Article 3 fails, which is setting um, the tax deadlines and making it two installments, if that were to fail, then it reverts to state statute. And state statute says that taxes are due 30 days after I mail them out 
in full at midnight. I typically mail them out the end of September. That would mean if, if that article fails that your tax bill would be due in full by midnight the end of October instead of November and May. Um, for the only article that's guaranteed to be revoted re if it fails is the budget. A new budget would have to be developed. Um, and you have to vote on it in the same manner as, as you originally voted on it. So it would be by Australian ballot and everybody would be mailed their ballot. Um, none of the other articles, there's a guarantee if they fail that they would be revoted. They would only be revoted if I receive a valid petition by 5% of the um, registered voters asking for a, uh, to rescind that vote and a revote. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick question. You just no, go to the, go to the microphone. Yeah. So that tax bill you're talking about in October would be the existing one we see today that we would be due to pay. Well, what would we see for a tax bill come October if Article Three is voted down? Article Three gets voted down. You said our taxes become due in October. Right. So, so, so I've lived in Morristown since 2007, and we've always had two tax installments. I don't know how long we've been doing that. Um, if this were to fail, we would just have one tax installment. It would be the tax bill that is based on July 1st of next year, um, and it would be for the 2000. 23-24 tax year. So it's the new tax bill that will be coming out. Your installment yep. that's due in May is still going to be due. Also, I should mention, if the budget fails and then we do the, a revote and that fails, we would keep um, having budget revotes <clears throat> until we pass them and they would all continue to be in the same manner as the original. So Australian ballot, everybody mailed their ballots. So I think... Um, is it fair to say that the, you know, what the tax bill, which would be based on whatever budget passes, if, if uh, Article 3 failed, would essentially look the same, except it would not have Installment. two installments. It would just give you, this is what is due. Um, yeah. yeah. Right, so one tax bill, the total amount, what we're, what we're going to see. Right. Calculate something. Right, exactly. Yep. And then we can all go to the Union Bank. <laughs> so I know it's been a long um, evening. Um, and I, I actually I just want to thank everyone for uh, what has been actually really informative, um, excellent questions, uh, very civil, um, and uh, it, it's sort of reaffirms the fact that we've got engagement in the community and reaffirms um, that we can actually have conversations that are difficult um, and be uh, civil during them. So I just want to thank everybody for being here and engaging in the way uh, that they have. So if there aren't any further questions, <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Burnham, I have one final statement, and I think I want to thank Eric and Tina for supplying uh, very accurate and uh, timely research on all the issues, and thank the select board for reviewing all that information and carrying out your civic duty in, in uh, proposing and forwarding the budget to us for, for consideration. I think you put a lot of time and effort into it, and I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you So are you looking for a So I, I, I want to... Uh, um, uh, I don't think we actually have to adjourn this because it's an informational meeting. So um, unless anybody is going to object, I think uh, we uh, are done for the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chef.